It's when it comes to a map number one. Yeah, we are going to be diving into Hecate to start off this series. Gumiho and Bjorn, it comes down to this for these two in the tournament. We'll be starting off in the top right-hand corner with the Red Terran player representing Cloud9. It's Gumiho. <laughs> and his opponent down here in the bottom left-hand corner, likewise also from South Korea, representing the Shopify Rebellion, we have Bjorn. Both of these players, of course, absolute fan favorites. When do you think is the very first time they played against each other? I don't actually have the right answer, but it must be a long time ago. 20, 2011. And, I, and also, there was a period where these two were the only players signing up to one of the Chinese, like, I say weekly cup, but it happened three times a week. Mm -hmm. And these two just met in the finals, like... <laughs> These two and Alive were just constantly in the finals with each other. They played so much back in. This was probably 2016, 2017, mm -hmm. around that sort of era. Is when Bjorn came back and like stormed the online scene and then kind of, you know, made it big in GSL and everything as well. But I mean, these two have, have absolutely had a history. I mean, it's hard not to when you've been around so long. You're absolutely right. Both of them extremely experienced. They've been playing this game professionally for over a decade, and they're still at the tippity top of the skill level. I find it difficult to predict who's going to win this. I'm slightly leaning towards Bjorn, just because overall he is usually the slightly stronger player. But Gumiho is perfectly capable of throwing a bit of a curveball, and already that is a nice and quick factory. Yeah, the last couple of times they met online, Gumiho did get the better end of things, and. Yeah, just a couple of open cups, but that is, uh, you know, valuable information as well. It was 2011 when they first played, by the way. So Ooh, nice guess. Real throwback. That makes sense. I don't think Bjorn was as big of a player in the first, the first like beta years of StarCraft 2, right? So yeah, a year after Sting still wins a liberty. An educated guess, I suppose. Faster command center right now for our player in blue. Faster factory right here for Gumiho. This is a difference that we see quite frequently in this matchup. You always have to make the decision, do I want more economy or do I prefer more tech and more units? This does, of course, mean that Gumiho will be a little bit more aggressive, or at the very least, he's going to have to make up for making some more units here earlier on. Yeah, you want to try and get out onto the map. You want to be the active player. This is what Gumiho's build is going to enable him to do. He's going to be an SCV or two behind eventually as well because of that later CC, so that's why you'd like to put some pressure on. And that's why it comes down to how well can Bjorn defend, who just goes, by the way, a Reaper, two Marines, and now a Hellion on the way as well. So not really a lot of focus on early game units. Instead, just kind of setting up to be a little bit defensive and then going from there. Absolutely. Starport's coming up right now. Reactor here also building on both sides of the map. Slightly different approach so far, but of course, this is what usually happens in the mirror matchups. Small deviations can lead towards very large results. Gumiho right now will scout the timing as well of that CC on the low ground. And well, we will see exactly what he's playing against. Yeah, single Cyclone on the way from both players as well, so we get that Cyclone stage started. We'll see how many we build, because you don't have to build all of them, right? Mm -hmm. Some players build one, and then they look for that faster Siege tank and so on. They're both going to get the Medivac up, though. And Gumiho not really finding too much straight away. His Orbital only just start morphing in. That's where Bjorn might take a one, maybe two worker lead. High-level SC2 mirror matchups are incredibly dynamic, but they can still be over in a heartbeat. A lot of these units have a ton of micro potential, and if you mess it up, that might just be GG. Now, luckily for us, both of these players are very good at controlling their units, but it's a very explosive game. And, well, we have the first Medivac moving across right now. Liberator coming up, okay, right behind it too. Bjorn, he may very well meet his opponent here in the center of the map, although I think they they're gonna pass each other miss. by. Yeah. yeah. Bjorn taking that kind of uh, upwards edge. Gumiho coming more to the left-hand side, so they miss each other a little bit. I mean, it's kind of an expected situation. Bjorn wins the slight fight out on the map. He's going to get a Hellion for the cost of a Reaper. The edge gets both, but that's not... None of those units really help you in this situation. His own Cyclone has landed as well. He does have two Cyclones here, and he's going to be able to lock on quickly and deny this. Locked onto that Medivac oh. as well. It just has the boost to get away, and Bjorn is continuing to be aggressive across the map. He's the one finding SCV so far, Loco, and it is Bjorn to definitely strike first. Yeah, Helia now also driving into that natural expansion here of Gumi, dealing a bunch of damage. He's still losing SCVs in the main base. This is not being properly handled yet. Reinforcing Cyclone Dope does oh, pop no. up. SCVs get the repair going, but this is still very close here for Gumi. It's like a house of cards, right? When it starts falling down, it's very hard to stop, and that's how the mirror matchups in SC2 can feel. You make one little mistake, that may just be the end of it. And, well, Gumio holds on for now, but he's already more than 10 workers behind. 
Yeah, I mean, that was horrible for Gumiho. They both went for a very similar attack, and Bjorn absolutely just bopped Gumiho's attempts away, mm -hmm. while Gumiho clearly struggled. You know, there was SCVs pulled, he had to mass repair one of his Cyclones, and it really comes down to follow-up. Gumiho is still not reactoring Cyclones, he's reactoring Marines, which just don't trade well against those Cyclones. I'm not quite sure what the goal of Gumiho's build is. Like, the Viking, I don't mind, maybe you zone out the Ravens mm -hmm. with that, but... You're playing off a Cyclone Deficit, the Marines aren't going to make up for it. He needed a tech lab and to start building tanks like yesterday, because that's meant to be his, you know, outcome if he's not going to match Bjorn in Cyclone numbers. Exactly. Yeah, now Cyclones are going to be faced out here for Gumi in just a moment as he is building a tech lab. And Viking is going to be nice as well to shut down this aggression once and for all, so those units are going to pay the price. Well, apparently Jimmy also will get shut down. Yeah, I mean, it is nice to shut that down, Bjorn. Has much less army supply, but he, I mean, I still like what he has in his army so much more. Mm -hmm. More Cyclones versus the Marines. I just, I don't see the Marines doing enough. Here's the Liberator going to try and get an annoying position here. Going right above those engineering base, so it's hard to get units in range. So just making oh. the most of it. Bjorn is obviously busy out on the map. The Cyclones of Gumiho are dead to me. This attack has been stopped already. And now Bjorn has to just go deal with his Liberator. And he's going to be right back on track. Those engineering bays delayed, which is an annoyance. So he slowed onto his 1-1. But I mean, Gumiho still needs that because he doesn't have anything similar for himself yet. Yeah, leading right now with the low HP Cyclone as well. He's got to be very careful. Auto turrets will be able to get rid of that Liberator once and for all. Cyclone number one falls. SCVs pulled away from the mineral line. That is a lot of workers going down though here in blue. Yeah, the Ravens were obviously in the back deal with the Liberator initially. So Bjorn has to use his workers to defend. And Gilmiho is able to leverage that army advantage into enough worker kills to equalize this game. And what a play that is, is Gumiho going to play a very different game as well. More gases, Banshee on the way. He wants to play this into... Well, I thought he was going to play this into Meg, but he put, drops down some barracks. Yep. Actually kind of surprised, no? Yeah, that is a bit strange for sure. I guess he was only on two gases all this time. So usually in TVT, you kind of want three because that's just how expensive everything is. Things are a little bit cheaper nowadays. But yep. then coupled with the Banshee, I was like... Yeah, he skipped a Raven for now. So I guess he's had a little bit of... Uh... A little bit of gas left over there, but he's decided to transition towards Bio instead. Now, that does mean that his upgrades are going to be quite a bit later, though. We've already got that 1-1 one -one coming here for Bjorn. Yes, the engineering base were delayed, but they ultimately did start up, right? We're going to go ahead and head on over into that combat shield research, too. That means that Bjorn is going to hit a big power spike on his Marines. Gumio, of course, does have defensive siege tanks, and that's what makes this matchup so difficult. Even when you are ahead, you need to, well, stim into siege tanks, right? And that is a decision you would rather not make so Gumiho gonna try and lean into that but 1-1 one, one starts up here for the player in red as well well this is just fascinating because there's gonna be this little bit of banji harass from Gumiho as well who already already has a little bit of a worker lead Bjorn, his army supply is in the lead, but some of it's made up of Cyclones, which are definitely being phased out at this point. They don't have as much of a role to play any longer. Mm -hmm. it, it was a really cool turnaround from Gumiho. Let's see what Bjorn can get here. Maybe a couple Marines, nothing too crazy, right? I mean, at least he's got map control with this. Yep. He's gonna try and harass here. Cyclones at this point, they just don't this survive for long enough, but he's getting a bunch of value yeah. out of it, though. There's a lot of Marines and a missile turret in position, so just denies that Banshee coming in for the moment. It will find a different position, a few Marines stim across, Ooh. and that's the difference, man. We're on stim, I believe we're on combat shield as well. Yep. The bio, if it was across the map and could fight right now, it's a one-sided battle. Doesn't matter about the tanks, because with combat shield and stim versus none of that, and 1-1, one, one, your Marines will just carry that fight anyway. Absolutely, and that's exactly what Bjorn is going to try and do. We're still about maybe 45 seconds yeah. Matrix. away from Gumiho finishing up all of those upgrades. They're on the right side of that production tab, although we have the upgrades right now in the top left of the corner. Yeah, but good example, right? Just look at everything yes. that Bjorn has that Gumiho does not. And with the Matrixes, you can take away the one defense advantage, which is the tanks. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a terrifying couple of moments for Gumiho if Bjorn goes right now. He did research the interference matrix as well, so those Ravens are going to be temporarily able to shut down those tanks from Gumi. This is not looking good right now for Gumiho. The siege tanks are going around the side here, not engaging over at the third base. This is very, very close, though, to finishing up those upgrades here for Gumiho. Look at that production tab. There they are on the right side of your screens as well. Yeah, Bjorn didn't know. He, he just didn't know. No, like, he, didn't he, know. he, he saw no combat shield, but he might be expecting combat shield to finish any second, not stim in 1-1. One, one. And so he's going to take a much slower effort here. He is going to lose one siege tank, but he's going to deny the mine, and position is so important still in TVT. So while Bjorn doesn't get into completely take control, he didn't know that he could, he's still going to gain something from this advantage, being able to get out onto the map early. Gumiho manages to stay alive here. Needed almost a little bit of luck. Decides to stim down some of those tanks here in blue. Bjorn not quite reacting to this yet, but 
He knows that there's a lot of Terran units here nearby as well. Cyclone's still on the right side of the map. Both players transition towards 2-2. I'm not loving this game here for Gumiho. He's uh, survived a few times already, but, you know, his economy is not bad. His upgrades are looking solid. It's looking a little bit better now than it did a few minutes ago, but this is not yeah. over yet. Bjorn actually driving up towards that high ground, trying to cut off some of these Terran units. And don't forget that he still has Ravens, although he just loses one Phalangi Raven. He will drop two Matrixes now to try and get the jump into this base, and he is going to be able to move into the Natural. The tanks will in Siege to relocate a little bit, and the Natural is just in trouble here. Gumiho gets one tank sieged up, but he's going to have to come in from a couple directions. He comes from the bottom left as well. The SCVs are pulling through. The tanks need to focus on the Marines. The Marines of Bjorn will do what they can. He's got a supply lead as Gumiho is going to get the cleanup. But Bjorn, of course, he kills a lot of SCVs. He killed a decent amount of army. And while he lost his tanks, he killed a good few tanks of Gumiho as well. An absolute bloodbath right there. Gumi forced to pull the SCVs, but he does stay alive. Bjorn, right now, he is the one who will need to play here defensively. He's got a Supply Depot on the left to see any incoming medevacs or Liberators or all the rest of it. That is not all too important at this stage in the game because he knows it's going to be a full frontal attack here from Gumi. Well, fourth Command Center, okay, trying to grow a little Planetary Fortress hat. It is going to finish that up here momentarily, and Bjorn deflects it. Cyclones, by the way. They've just these, been way and yeah, these have been incredibly cost-efficient. Yeah, I love it. I mean, don't forget they got a bunch of Marines before they went down earlier as yeah. well. They're going to get a couple extra at the end, too. Just another little nail that kind of tightens the coffin closing for Gumiho. We're maybe not quite there yet, but it's no. definitely a lot of advantages to Bjorn. I'm yet to see something that Gumiho's going to make me like go like, oh yeah, that's good for him for. This drop loads up. I mean, Bjorn just saw all these red dots disappear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not sure what you do with that. Bjorn's also going to load up himself. Gumiho's just going to retreat. The thing is, though, when you're behind in TVT, that's also the moment where you can start oh. playing crazy. Okay, gets a bit unlucky here. Bjorn loves to do this. He doesn't necessarily need to do something like this, right? But he's going to try and see if he can force the issue. Loads up his Metavex, but indeed, Gumiho right now, he knows he's not in the greatest of spots, so he decides to take a chance. In the meantime, though, Bjorn has arrived on the other side of the map. Liberator of Gumiho is harassing over at the fourth base, too. Gumi does have a lot of reinforcements, but his drops do get spotted. Yeah, and not just spotted. They might be trapped in the corner a little bit. Bjorn lost one of the Metavex here full of units just because he didn't really go deep enough, but he was chasing those Metavex down. They really are stuck in a corner. This Vikings there as well. Bjorn, he needs to go back down. He's got a surround on this entire army. There's nowhere to run to. I mean, we go further north, but you just can't get away. Gumiho's supply is slowly dying, and he's going to spam the recall ability on his command center, but he's not a Protoss! Oh, no. Accidentally picked Aaron on the loading screen. Hate it when that happens. That is, though, about 50 army supply down the drain for Gumiho, getting absolutely nothing. He does have a planetary fortress set up over here, but the siege tanks of Bjorn have already arrived I mean you can repair but how in the world are you ever gonna shut this down the army is way too big right now Gumiho is gonna have to defend with whatever he's got okay instead he decides to go across the map but I just don't see how he's gonna be able to pull it off well he will try go for one last ditch effort mass marine across the map is a classic Terran strategy when you're yes. in trouble and it's brought so many players back before, but Bjorn has not rallied everything across. He's got so many tanks Whoa. here, and as Gumiho sees this, he's going to realize the trouble he is in. Bjorn gets rid of one of the tanks here as well. He'll just step back. He doesn't need to rush into it. This CC goes down. That's absolutely fine, as Bjorn is getting rid of the third, and Gumiho knows, can't recover from that. Bjorn is able to grab the first game of this best of five. Very well played right there by Bjorn. Not really making a whole lot of errors here. Playing it slowly. I mean, he obviously did get a bit aggressive with his Cyclones, but ultimately every single trade that we saw, he just got small advantages, right? And ultimately that leads towards a, well, a very notable one. <laughs> and obviously getting your entire army trapped inside a Metavex in the top left hand corner. Not ideal right there for Gumi. This is definitely interesting because Gumiho brought himself back from trouble and I think he brought himself back, but what Bjorn didn't realize right now, he's probably like, oh man, he just equalized the game. But Gumiho's infrastructure was so far behind. He was so behind on the upgrades and everything. If Bjorn recognized that sooner, he could have done more. And what he did was still enough in the end because he used it to leverage other advantages. This was a cleanup, but look at Gumiho's supply during this. He's losing so many SCVs. And Bjorn's got a fourth base up already during this as well. So that's why Bjorn is always going to just be in a bit of a better spot. He had the Cyclones around to get a few more kills. And he just did that very, very nicely to get himself into the advantage in the game one. And this this was kind of the game ending moment because Gumi yep. just got stuck and those two Vikings guaranteed that these medivacs would not get out. Oh, you're absolutely right. He decided to go for one last ditch effort there, one big drop into the main base. Sometimes if you can get, for example, sieged up, right? 
if you can get sieged up inside of the main base of your opponent, uh, it can still do a lot of damage. All right, we're going to take a moment here for a quick break. We will be right back. <laughs> Hello everyone, uh, welcome to our uh, stats comparisons. Uh, I'm joined here by friendly guests Astrea and uh, Skillers. I think you might know them. I'm, I'm, I'm of course a Kellizer, so let's dive right into it. All right. <sighs> so, that is actually higher than I thought it would be. It's hard to have a reference of what, <laughs> who's the lowest and who's the highest. Uh -huh. but, uh, it says overall I'm 77. Okay. Um, actually, attack is not my highest. It's 77. <laughs> but uh, defense, 74. Strategy, 77. Speed, 75. Macro and micro, 78. What do you guys think? That sounds about right. Yeah? Yeah. I, I, I could put you higher, but... Yeah. Higher? Yeah. So I think you're powerful. I'm powerful? Yeah. But like above average? I don't know what average is, but... Yeah, that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Like, what's the average for this tournament? It has to be the highest, because, you know, the best players are here. Uh, yeah. what, what's yours, for example? Okay, I've got 81 overall. I've got 77 in attack, 83 in defense, 86 in strategy, 77 in speed, 84 in macro, and 79 in micro. Okay. So you're four points higher than me in average, or in I overall? Was, I think I was four points below you in Atlanta. Yeah, that's true, actually. <laughs> Somehow uh, the system changed, I guess, from Atlanta, where it was before it was the event mm. that gave us the scores. Now we rated ourselves. So I can see the players think a little bit less of me than the organization. <laughs> <laughs> what can you do? What do you think? What do you guys think is my other uh, stuff? I think you got maybe about the same or slightly higher than me. Okay, so what's the number? Maybe 80, 81 also. Okay, what's the other thing? Yeah, I think like 80 average sounds about right. 80 overall. And 78. 78? 78. 78. But it looks like I'm a very well-rounded player because I have 79 in attack, 79 in defense, 79 in macro, and strategy speed in micro is 77. So I'm like, you know, just not good at anything, <laughs> but also not better at anything. That's good. You're a jack of all trades. Good stuff. Okay, so I guess that's why they paired us up because we're all Pretty similar. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> like, imagine there was m me, Cyril, and, and Clem, you know. I yeah. Look pretty bad. So. I, I like the way That's it was true. arranged this time. But uh, yeah, you guys have any final thoughts on our stats? Are you happy with our stats? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course, happy. I thought it was going to be in the 60s or like low 70s, but. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's for, solid. for now, I'm happy. I, I, I want to see who's the lowest <laughs> to have some comparison. But. Well, I'm happy I got an 86 in strategy. People are recognizing it NA as <laughs> big brain strategies. But I, I, there's no way that's correct, though, because you got 77 attack and 83 defense when it should be the other way around. That, wait, you think I'm better at attacking than defending? I think so. Uh, I disagree. Why? I don't think I'm good at attacking. Well, I mean, as you're better than defending, that's all you do is attack. Big attacker. Uh, really? Yeah. Okay. I disagree. I have more experience playing against you than you do. <laughs> I guess that's I true. I know better. <laughs> okay, if you say so. All right. So, um, guys, this was the uh, stats comparison. Hope you guys enjoyed it. What do you think? Let us know in the comments. I love these little videos, Wardy. Always nice to hear the pro gamers talk about their ratings and their stats. So to clarify, those are the ratings that the pro gamers gave each other. So they had to fill out a form and basically rate each other. And well, ultimately, I guess that's as fair as it's going to be. You know, I, I love Kalza. as like, man, I, I feel like, you know, you're not as good at defending. I'm like, Kalza, it's probably because you're dropping him all the time, like nonstop. <laughs> Every, everyone else is like a bit more chill attacking into his trade. Like, yeah. oh, he's pretty good. You just attack him anyway. So maybe that has something to do with his opinion. As we hop back into this TVT, two well matched players based on player ratings in this one as well. As we are going to be starting to the upper right hand side of Equilibrium. We don't get this one every day, so let's make the most of it. From Cloud9, our Red Terror looking to bounce back in the series is Gumiho. <laughs> <laughs> Gumiho, of course, known for his strategic uh, variety, right? He probably has a very high rating in that department. His opponent, though, in the top left-hand corner of the map, very high in that attacking stat, it's Bion.
Equilibrium, a map we haven't seen all too much so far in this tournament. Obviously, in a best of five series, you only get to veto, well, two maps each. A little bit different than what we've had so far in the best of threes. And you pick a map after yes. one veto. So you do one veto, one map pick, one veto, one map pick. And in TVT, you know, you could have just let Equilibrium go to the second round of vetoes. Ooh. But uh, Bion was like, no, 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 let's play Equilibrium. He picked it, so kind of interested to see what his, what his plan is. This one doesn't get seen a lot of play. It's a massive map, so you naturally get split up a lot. You naturally end up in very long games. And TVT, it just feels like if you get an advantage early, it's then very difficult to take that advantage. And it's already tough to do that in TVT, to like do something with your lead. On a map like Equilibrium, even more so. So for an aggressive so player... wide, right? It takes yeah. ages for dropships to arrive. So an aggressive player like Bjorn, I'm like, well, what are, what are we seeing on this map? Like, do yeah. you love the drop patterns? Like, the ability to kind of hit the main base a lot? Well, the moment Gimme Hope puts five turrets in his main base, that's over. So very intrigued to see what Bjorn is going to do here overall. He is going to expand more quickly here in this game too. Absolutely. Faster factory once again here for Gumi, just like what we saw in game number one. We'll see him follow this up though with a command center on the low ground momentarily. It's just a single gas geyser here as well for the player in red. So nothing all too crazy as both players are trying to scout out and see if there's any, well, early game proxies on their side of the map. Equilibrium though, together with Raduset, those are the most vetoed maps in the current StarCraft II map pool. That being said, of course, the longer that this tournament runs, the further we go into it, the more best of fives and, well, ultimately a best of seven we will get to. So the more map variety we will see as well. Very true. As you see, everybody showing up is going to start going on to this SCV. And it's going to be able to grab that straight away. Nice start. It's actually it's a Marine out already here from Gumi Hose's second unit. It will get some shots off, and that means the Reaper showing up will then chase. And the Hellion popping out means that Bjorn will lose a Reaper. I don't hate this. He got an SCV, and he... Yep. Drag the units all the way into the main. So it's going to take a few extra moments to get across the map as Gumiho gives Bjorn a little bit more time to get a cyclone out, and then he should be absolutely fine. The factory advantage here for Gumiho, slightly deflected already. It's minor, but it's not a bad start right here for Bjorn whatsoever. He also slowed down that command center from Gumi ever so slightly. And while well, considering Bjorn's CC was a bit quicker, That'll be something he will be relatively happy about. Now the Cyclone is just about to pop. It's going to be excellent at, well, defending that base. And Gumi sees right now, hey, I do not really want to hang out here. There's a command center on the low ground. I know that the Cyclone will be out in just a second or two. I need to preserve that Reaper and not give anything away. This time we do have a uh, reactor up from Gumi Honey. is going to start uh, reacting out some Cyclones. Uh, I kind of agreed with the desk where it was like, you know, I don't think these guys are necessarily going to build as many Cyclones, but so far that's clearly not been true. I mean, yep. in the first game, Gumi Ho tried to go without, then it got all messed up and he had to build an extra, and then he was kind of like in a bit of a weird spot on his opening altogether. Uh, well, we're going to see oh. Gumi Ho immediately go Hyperfly Road as this game. Wow. So, I mean, that's one thing to expect on Equilibrium, perhaps super big map. Maybe yeah. Up. So that is the Benchy Speed upgrade. Generally one of the least seen upgrades in SC2, although it's gotten more love over the last year or so. With Benchies, whenever we do have Benchies, it's pretty much always the cloaking upgrade first. Apparently Gumi, with his special tactics, is ready to go for a little bit of variety there. He is going to go for a second tech lab as well, so he's not just going to stick around on well, a bunch of Cyclones and Benchies, but we'll have to see what he decides to do with it. Yep, I do have our CC dropping down on that natural location. The Interference Matrix upgrade starts from Bjorn. Getting that Raven underway. Those couple extra Cyclones about to be done. And obviously just get set up from there. Immediate Siege Tank from Gumiho. So he just wants to get defensible, uh, de defended basically against any Cyclones from his opponent. And this Liberator is going to show up. There were Cyclones in the main base. I believe they're still there a little bit south of our camera right now. So they will be nearby to deal with this. But the idea from Bjorn should be to do something to force those Cyclones to defend at the front. Mm -hmm. Then the Liberator heads into the main mineral line. Gumiho hiding, by the way, that Benchy all the way in the top right-hand corner. He's also decided to go for the threading upgrade for those Cyclones. So he's going for a speed boost for his Benchies, as well as a speed boost for his Cyclones. He's going to try and get the jump on his opponent. In the meantime, Siege Tank's already being produced as well, as Bion decides to go for a cheeky gold base. Scan right now reveals that something is a little bit fishy. Oh, Bjorn is on the way. He accidentally <laughs> queued up on a tech move there. Don't tell him, Bjorn. <laughs> yeah, we are going to see Bjorn just instantly taking the gold, which if you get away with that, brilliant. But if you don't get away with it, I mean, Hyperfly Rotopanchi is that speed. It's more distance for Bjorn to cover. So 
That's already an interesting little question Absolutely. mark if Gumiho can stop him from really taking advantage of a gold. And do you really read this properly as Bjorn, right? So the interference matrix upgrade now is something that needs to be researched. So he sees the green light inside of that tech lab. It's a relatively quick research. So there's a chance that Bjorn picks up on it just based off of the timing that it is going to be Benchies, but he does need to respect them because they do a lot of damage very quick. And then we're just going to play Bios, Gumiho, like... <laughs> yeah. Who who goes hyperflight road is no cloak into bio. <laughs> well, Gumiho has probably got like an eighty nine or something in strategy. Maybe, maybe. Three. Okay, yeah. Uh, I mean, this this is a level ninety three strategy. If yeah, it works. absolutely. <laughs> if it works, I mean, this is why he's got that high score. He I doesn't know. know about the gold though. Yeah, he missed it. He just missed those couple SCVs going over there, which is a bit of a shame. It's gonna come from the south side and end up in this natural, and Bjorn gonna have to pull away and start dealing with this. Oh. And uh, he's going to lose a few of these Hello. SCVs. Not as good target fire as it could have been. Yeah, we definitely want to be targeting those SCVs. The reason you go for two benchies is so you can perfectly one-shot those workers. He's still going to get into the main base, though. You don't need cloaking. As <laughs> you can just run away. And oh. get the reactors cancelled. Goes into... Uh, yeah. No, sorry. Yeah, the other way around, yeah. He wanted to go into the tech labs there for just a moment. Decided to go for the reactors instead. So he thought it was mech, and he was going tech labs for marauders. Yep. He's picked up on the fact it's not mech, and he's getting re reactors from Marine. So that's the right exactly. call from Bjorn. That puts him in a better position, because if he builds Marauders, it's really funny, Marauders are usually very useful in bio, but in TVT, you play Marine Tank or Marine Tank, and it's simply because the tankiness of the Marauder does not make up for the DPS you lose that you could have had in Marines instead. And it costs a bit of gas, so pretty much if you build Marauders, and it's not against mech, you're going to lose out in the Marine Tank fights. You're absolutely right. Benchies have still not seen the third base, though, and this can backfire really quickly. Bjorn has decided to take his third base all the way over at the Golden Minerals, and now he's going to check for it. Those Golden Minerals, of course, they return more. They return seven minerals a trip rather than the conventional five. There's a rich Vespian Geyser, too. All right, and the Missile Turret. That rich gas geyser, it returns eight gas a trip rather than four. So this is a very nice base here for Bjorn to have. Those workers that he's lost, he can make up for that pretty easily just by having the more powerful resources. Yeah, that's very true. Less workers, but Bjorn's income is probably in a pretty good spot anyway. And uh, I guess we're just waiting on 2-2 two -two upgrades to start very shortly, as 1-1 one -one is done. You see Gumiho again, his uh, fourth already building up as well, so he's not slowing down oh. in the slightest as this Liberator gets by. Yeah, he does slip by into the natural expansion as we switch to the first-person view right here of Bjorn, roaming around the map trying his very best to stay ahead of his opponent, looking for a fourth command center himself right now too. He sees the siege tanks though. Not much he can get done, but he can grab one of those cyclones. He needs to start up the fourth command center here. Yeah, two, two upgrades as well. I'm not sure if he, I think he has just started those, hasn't he? So yep. uh, I guess that fourth CC on the way. The nice thing about how already having the gold is you're already drawn out a bit on the map. So then it's like taking a fourth isn't as difficult. I'm still worried about this triangle base because it's so important for Bjorn to hold the top of the map because the moment Gumiho gets through the top and sieges towards the main using that triangle base as a siege is super terrifying. So that's going to be a very important part of this. You can see Bjorn running into a little bit of a fight here potentially. He's going to back it up. He's going to be okay. He takes that watchtower and you can just see him figuring out if he wants to take some kind of a fight or not. Absolutely. He's got a bunch of Ravens here in a mix. Very useful unit in this particular matchup. Hits a small little supply block, starts up a depot, drops a depot out of the high heavens as well. And now we're going to go for the final three barracks. Yeah, going to swap that barracks off the tech lab as well. You can probably put a factory or so on that. Yep, going to do exactly that. So we're going to see the Cyclones a little bit off guard. He gets only one medevac out of this. The Marines will chase. Is there anything nearby to help? His own Marines will stim down to try and save the day and two Cyclones live. I mean, it's nice to just keep them alive. We saw them just run into a mineral line in game one, get a little bit more damage. That was very cool to see there as well. We're going to lose one more now. These few Marines give themselves up for it. I mean, I don't hate it on either side, right? You get rid of those Cyclones. A few Marines are replaceable. And as Bion, you get a few Marines back. It's a very 50-50 trade. Absolutely. I always love seeing the first-person view. It's always really nice to see exactly what these players are looking at. It's a little different than just watching their perspective from a replay, of course, because you can't quite see the exact mouse movement. Either way, Gumiho is setting up that fourth base here over on the right side of the map at about 3 o'clock position. Bjorn at this point has not quite picked up on it yet, but he does see the sensor tower on the mini-map, and that's a clear giveaway, as we do have the fleet beacon, or the fusion core, rather, the Terran fleet beacon on the production tab right now for Gumi too. I know Gumiho wanted to be a pro to recall in that last game, but that <laughs> is still going to be a fusion core, as Bjorn is going to be completely out of position with anything here. This drop gets 14 SCVs. 
Byun's army is massive. Yeah. But how do you take advantage of that? So hard, right? Like, he needs the interference matrix, the opponent's siege tanks, but getting perfect vision is really tough. Gumiho right now also sieging up, like, a bunch of those Liberators as soon as he gets them going. Well, apparently this is the moment right here. Yeah, this is going to be the moment he gets the Matrixes on all those forward tanks. His own tanks will get Siege. There's a tank further back. That might be as far as we go, but he will get in position, take a few SEVs, and now potentially jump in the main while the Vikings are out of position. His gold under fire as well. He goes past the missile turrets and just hits this main. Gumiho has nothing here at all. The Marines have to run across, and this is where Bjorn is going to fight a whole bunch of extra SCVs before this is cleaned up. So Bjorn making some moves. Gumiho's supply is dropping. Remember that Bjorn will lose a lot on the tail end of this, so his supply will drop a little as well. But he is denying that third base from landing, and that's going to add up also. You're absolutely right. There's not really that much income right now here for Gumi. Bjorn trying his very best to deal as much damage as possible, and he's reinforcing this with mass marine siege tanks. Starts up the plus three, plus three. The armor upgrade first, because of course this is Bjorn. That's what he loves to do. Liberators up in the sky are going to try and get rid of as many of the tanks as possible, but in the meantime, Bjorn has arrived with all of his reinforcements, stimming forward, trying to get as much damage done as he can. Ultimately, though, I think Gumio should be able to deflect this. Yeah, I mean, I think Bjorn wanted to try and get towards the libs on that top side. Kumiho is making the tech, tech forward into Liberators. Bjorn is playing super mass marine tank, right? So it's actually very important that Bjorn doesn't give a pressure. His army supply advantage is good, but because it's a worse army as well, so he needs to keep on using it. Stuff like 3-3 will help him out with that, but it's terrifying when these Liberator counts get up. And that's why he's got to keep this game chaotic. He's got to keep this game with him just mining more by denying this base. And drops like this are so oh! important as well. These tanks are not sieged up just yet, so a big drop in. And Gumiho is going to be losing a couple of tanks. All these Marines, the Vikings and Liberators as well, not great on their own against this Marine drop. We have the Marines finally showing up. There was a tank here as well, gets a few hits, and Bjorn even escapes with a couple of units. Yeah, Command Center also not in a very good position there as it ends up falling beyond getting so much damage done creating chaos all over the map he is gonna lose another well siege tank i thought at the very least if it would be targeted instead a marine decided to jump there kumio decides to go for the golden minerals but he has taken this one blindly he has no clue where beyond's army is currently at he just knows that it's yeah. coming this is Incredibly difficult right now for Gumi. He always needs to get a little bit lucky, and lucky he will not be as that command center gets spotted. Even the siege tanks on the high ground are not safe. This is going from bad to worse right now. Bjorn is one of the only players who plays like this in TVT. Like, he is one of the few players that says, TVT, the most defendable matchup of all time. I will just mass you <laughs> to run into you repeatedly. And he just has the ability to keep it going and keep it chaotic enough. So it's it's scary though, because even though he's ahead on supply, he's ahead on bases, he's got the better upgrades, one extremely bad fight loses his, him his momentum, mm -hmm. and that could be Gumiho's road right back in. So it looks great for Bjorn, but it can all come crashing down. You're absolutely right. There's so many siege tanks, right? And those siege tanks just need about eh, three shells or so to go well, and suddenly, this army may not look quite as menacing as Bjorn decides to commit for another wave. This time around, though, there are so many tanks. Is there enough here? I don't think so. Um, Bjorn's army supply plummets. It does, but he got a few shots off, and he was able to at least take out a few Marines of his opponent in the meantime as well. He's going to run over here to try and chase these medevacs down. But yeah, too many tanks in this position, and maybe he needs to work his way down the bottom side, but that's difficult because of the sensor towers. Yeah. That's why Gumiho is holding on. He's like, okay, this is the only real position I have to put focus on right now. As we're going to aim and get rid of that Liberator here. It's going to knock that down. This tank will unsiege back it away a little bit. And we have Bjorn still just sitting about 20 supply ahead with that upgrade lead as well. I mean, 3 3 to 2 2 means that any of these Marine fights are super Bjorn favored. Absolutely. Gumio trying to build up as many siege tanks and liberators for the most part as he can. He wants to obviously make sure he's got a sufficient amount of marines too. Bjorn once again found a bit of an opening inside of his opponent's main base. I would not mind seeing another missile turret or so, but obviously Gumiho is just trying to play the survival game here. Fires up 3-3 though. Apparently he's got a feeling that this game may go on for a lot longer and he can actually get value out of it. But this is pricey. Good scan right there as well for Bjorn. I think he has to though, right? Because yeah, he in needs theory, he's not going to end the game soon. So unless you're going to say, I'm going to play this entire game, a set of upgrades down, you have to fit the upgrades in somewhere. Because if you don't, then you're saying, well, either Bjorn kills me or what? Mm. You know, I play from behind the entire time. Again, Bjorn diving in. This time getting some tanks a bit further forward. I feel like the tank line is disintegrating here. There's a couple left over there, here and there. We're even trying to repair tanks against Marines. That doesn't usually end well, but Gumiho's just trying to find any moment that he can. Now Bjorn says, I want to go after these Liberators, protect my own siege tanks. We'll get the 
Deliverer is that tank is pretty unprotected. GG. Ho says GG. He just cannot regain control of this endless stream of Terran that comes from Bjorn. And that is exactly why the pro gamers, they rate Bjorn incredibly highly in that attacking stat. He's always, well, had a relatively low defense compared to his offense, and it's extremely obvious in this match. The man loves making Marines. He loves, well, sending them across the map. And usually as soon as he gets a medevac out, he will be loading it up and he will try and send it towards the other side. And once Bjorn starts, he never really lets go, right? He tries to get that tempo advantage, and then he just goes, goes, goes across the map. Wonderfully played right here by Bjorn, but obviously, you already brought it up. It's very easy for this to completely misfire, right? Like, you look at this, you're like, oh, I'm going to do this in my own games too, and you give it a try, and you run all your Marines into <laughs> it, It's almost impossible. You have to yeah. never miss a round of production. You have to have yeah. base after base coming up online, and you always have to be making a move, because you saw it. The moment Gumi Hosoda got entrenched on that third location, it was like, okay, interesting. You got entrenched in that third base, and then it's much harder for Gumi, uh, for Bjorn to break. In the end, Gumiho types GG only tends to play behind, but because he just knew he couldn't get enough stuff in the right places at the right time. And so now Gumiho sits down 0-2 in this best of five. Round of 12, Bjorn is a map away from a quarterfinals against Maru. Well, that's a tough TVT, but hey, if you win this one convincingly, maybe there's some chance tomorrow. Yeah, you are absolutely right. Very well done so far here by Bjorn. He needs to win one more map to get that chance against Maru. Maru's Terran versus Terran, of course. Very well known. Either way, we've got a small technical difficulty. We'll be right back.
we are going to continue our round of 12 match. It's a best of five series between Gumi Ho and Bjorn. At this point, Bjorn is 2-0 ahead in this series. Do you think Gumi can bring it back? Yeah, I mean, TBT is volatile enough, right, that even if you get behind in one game, you can bring it back. I think in a series it's possible. Do you think Bjorn's playing well? But it's mm. just little things that are getting him ahead, right? The tiniest of advantages that he's able to keep on pushing. And the style he just played works on very big maps in a way because it's like your opponent gets more drawn out. Don't necessarily know if you'll be able to find that sort of style again. So if you go back to the more standard TVT, don't see why Gumi Ho could not get back into it. Absolutely. It's the little things that sometimes go wrong and they can lead to very large results. Now he needs to win three in a row, though, against one of the greatest Terran players of all time, beyond feeling comfortable. In the past, we have seen Bjorn have some wrist issues, especially on long tournament days. He seems to have that under control a lot more over the last year or so, but it is something that has haunted him as well with this particular tournament in the past. So hopefully it's not going to be an issue for him today. Hopefully not. Hopefully we just get some clean, good StarCraft as we get ready to go on Oceanborn. Can we get this ready to rumble? So. We're going to get this uh, up and running in a second. We get this onto the third map. In the top left-hand corner, down 0-2 and fighting for his tournament life. It's time to make some noise for Cloud9's Gumi Ho! Down here in the bottom right, 2-0 up. It is Bian. Game number three, Bjorn sends an SCV forwards. He's got a couple game advantage to play with. He can get a bit cheeky here. Yeah, no gas, no barracks, no nothing so far. Okay, we are going to start up the barracks eventually at home. That one started up at about 200 minerals. I thought for a second we had something crazy in mind. Yeah, the second racks, I think, on the map, right? So you build second racks on the map, and it's still a good way to control the game early. Maybe get a quick win if your opponent miss micros, but it gives... I, I think Bjorn loves these kind of builds. Clem as well. Yeah. You get control, you're in, you know, able to show off your own micro early in the game, and you can play into a lot of just the active styles that those sort of players generally love to play. Absolutely. Bjorn and Clem, well, those are also, in my mind, the two best micro Terrans in the world, so I uh, can imagine that indeed they do enjoy playing these Reaper-based openers. Bjorn in the past, Massive fan of the Reaper. Got it nerfed a couple times, and then ultimately he stopped playing it for a bit. Went off to the military, came back. Took a little bit to uh, get back into the swing of things when it came to that Reaper Micro. But these days, it is a once again phenomenal. We'll see. Can he win the game with it straight up? That's the question. Yeah, we'll see. I, it's not obviously something that's designed to win the game straight up. This is very much so that one of those pressure builds. So don't be worried if he doesn't, as we're going to see Gumi Ho's first person view here early. Gumi Ho is once again um, going into something actually a little different, right? He's been pretty active about going into that second gas. This time it's one gas. He does at least expand, uh, put something extra down before he goes for the expansion. Yep. He is once again going to go for that single gas expo. But this is after a factory, so at the very least, he will be yeah. able to pump out a heli in here relatively Ma early. Marine isn't good against the Reapers, though. So nope. that's actually going to be a little bit interesting. And he, did he go just Marine first, and that's why he's able to afford the factory? Because if so, that actually could be weirdly susceptible to this, because the Reapers will do very well. Yeah. Okay, he does have one Reaper here, but he actually gets it caught. He's going to lose it. It gets grenaded forward. He's going to lose the Reaper. This is really bad, because Gooby Ho is now going to lose the Marine as well. And now, yes, you're going to get a Hellion out, but a Hellion oh. dies very quickly, and he knows it. He knows that that's bad. He was already shaking his hand, even taking his hand off the mouse for just a moment, it seemed. But, okay, even that command center right now, it's so much trouble, right? The problem is, how in the world are you going to finish it up? There's... Well, okay, at least he gets the snipe right there with the uh, the Hellion fire, but there's so much time already being bought right here for Bjorn. That command center will probably finish eventually, but it's going to take a while. Yep, absolutely. He's going to try and come back up. This is why he was sad about losing the Reaper, because he has the potential to kill the Hellion and go for more. The Recyclone is on its way, but not ready just yet. Three Reapers will two-shot SCVs. We're going to start getting some extra kills. The more kills you get right now, the better off this is. The Cyclone pops, though. Multiple Reapers going down. This will be the end of Bjorn's aggression. Yeah, Bjorn's slamming his head off the chair, because he knows he had potential to end the game here, possibly, yes. and he missed micro it. Losing about three Reapers there in total is going to slow him down and it is going to force him into a more defensive position. And if you look at the production tab right now, how bad is this really for Gumi? 
Yeah, I mean, he's got tech advantage, right, is what is one of those things. The CC is at the same time, at the very least. He is a couple of workers down that can be impactful, but he actually has a little bit more army supply. The starport being further along means the medevac is here already, so that will help as our CC is going to be finishing up shortly from Bjorn, and he's trying to keep some map control through Reapers in the cycle and still sitting out in the center. Considering how many Reapers he lost, he's built a lot of Reapers this game, so that's a lot of gas invested. No, you're absolutely right. Gumi needs to be very careful. It's easy to get in over your head here and move across the map. You're like, oh, I just killed my opponent's Reapers. How much can he really have? And then suddenly on the high ground, there's a large army waiting. Gumio is going to scout instead right here using just one Hellion as bait. But Bion has mostly just given up on this aggression, right? He's decided to go all the way back home. Problem with having to fly that barracks all the way back is that your add-ons that you might be able to produce on it well, they're going to be quite late. Luckily, it was a second barrack, so he's not completely slowed down in that department. But now it's, well, Gumiho's turn to put on a little bit of pressure. Does Bjorn also take his Cyclones across the map? Because I actually really hate this if he does. Because he's got a medevac popping. It kind of feels like he needs his Cyclones to defend. And if the Cyclones go across, that's going to be so late for Bjorn in comparison. So I like that they're staying back at home for now. In the medevac, so they can go wherever they need to be quickly. And he's going to be able to do just that. Boosting across here. Instantly forces the lift off, the boost away. Medevac takes quite a few shots. Yeah. Good defense from Bjorn. Did exactly what he had to there. He's got 150 health on the Medivac and 72 remains, so more than half of it is gone. That means that Gumiho needs to be very careful. He can really not commit once again because it's very easy to lose that unit. And at that point, well, I think that's basically the game, right? So he's going to be flying back home. Instead, now it's Bjorn, who's also making that assumption, who will be sending a similar set of units towards the other side. There is a one Viking available here for Gumi. So at the very least, he's going to be able to shut this down a little bit. But, oh, well, Bjorn just boosts straight into it. Yeah, not only because he didn't see it, right? He's going to unload now. He does not have in, uh, interest in committing further through on that one. So those Cyclones are going to take a step backwards, loading back into the Medivac, and away we go. The Stimpak is halfway done from Bjorn already, so he's very quick to transition through. He already had a second rack, so he hasn't had to float home. But once that is home, that transition to the bio comes very naturally. Double Engineering Bay, coming up right now for Bjorn. He is ready to play a bit of a macro match as he did go into that Stimpak upgrade as well. Second tech lab right now, or even third tech lab coming up. Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, you can see the army supply advantage of Gumiho, and he is pushing, so it's going to be tough for Bjorn to defend against this. This is tanks, this is marines. This is just a lot of firepower. Bjorn is going to have to absolutely just sit very, very safely here, but that's going to be tough. Gumiho is going to have air control. The Liberator can push back, back siege tanks as well. Let's see what happens here. Bjorn doesn't know he sees it right now. Oh. Recognizing it, gets the tank siege. The Liberate will come forward. The Cyclones need to get rid of that Liv, I think. That's got to be their priority. SCVs pull immediately from Bjorn as he recognizes the need to defend, but he's going to start losing a lot. Yeah, he's already lost so many workers. Stimpak finishes up right as every single Marine has died. Bjorn realizes that he had a chance to win this game with the Reaper if he would have micro them perfectly. And obviously, well, he takes his own control very seriously. So that mistake, it's gonna cost him, and it's Gumiho who gets a point on the board in this best of five series. Yeah, if Yun was a little bit like her away from a 3-0 here, you know, if that Hellion had gone down, if he kept the first Reaper alive, so many little moments throughout that could have been great for him, and just none of them were quite what they needed to be. You know, then he tries to fight the Cyclone, loses two more Reapers, and he knows it, man. Like, he knows the situation was great, because killing that first Reaper, killing this first Marine is so good for you. And he's so smart to jump out here, not go for too much extra, wait for three Reapers, yep. try and kill the Hellion. That was a good bit of micro from Gumiho. And then the Cyclone pops, the Reapers start dropping, you, you lose actually two here, because he turns onto the Cyclone, yeah. but he doesn't have the numbers to do that. No, so, he yeah. ran the wrong direction there for just a moment. Moment, and that may have just been all it took. Sometimes in your own mind, you've already won the game, right? You're like, oh my god, I'm doing so well. I'm moving on to the quarter. Fine, never mind. Yeah, brutal moment from Bjorn. Needs to reset after this one. Say, well, hey, look, the first couple games still very much so went my way. I went for something here, and yes, I had a chance, but hey, I've had the chance every game so far, right? So keep that momentum in mind and just take it into the next one. Try and do it again in game number four. As Gumiho will at least give us a series here on the stage. Absolutely. Yeah. Bjorn needs to make sure that this does not go into his head all too much, though, right? Because that is one of those moments where you can start criticizing yourself a bit too harshly. This may all be, uh, yeah, all that Gumiho really needs. Man, he's really good at typing with a, with a towel on his hand. He, he's done this a couple of times on camera already. I think I would miss every key. You can do anything with practice. That's true. Well said. Thank you. Gumiho, a little, little smile on stage, a little giggle. Maybe something fun said in the lobby here. Bjorn's like, ah, 
goes to a micro or something because you know what Bjorn's like. He's a fun character. He, yep. he will make a fun little comment before the game gets going. As we are looking into our game four here very shortly. Bjorn, a little bit more of a smile on his face, getting back on control of his emotions perhaps after that previous game. And ready enough to try and still take this series down, book himself into those quarterfinals. Maru waiting in this TVT onslaught on the bottom side of the bracket. Absolutely. In case you're wondering why Gumiho is playing with a little towel, he's had this for a very, very long time, to the point where some of the other Korean Terrans have also been mixing it in themselves. Apparently he has excessive sweating from the hands, and this is his solution. Can I imagine that uh, when he first found out about that, he's like, oh man, it's going to be so hard to be a professional gamer. And he just found a solution around it, and it's been working really well for him, to the point where we were talking about it actually earlier today as well, but even players like Maru, they've been playing with a little towel. Yeah, Maru actually usually sets up a little fan to the side of his mouse and just mm -hmm. has that like on his hand the entire game. I think that's quite clever. I'm surprised we haven't seen more programmers do that. Usually, it's I think. A head cooling. Well, I think some players have the opposite issue, right, where they need their hands to be warmer. Like you see a lot of the time, the hand warmers on stage as well. That's uh, that's definitely an interesting, uh, interesting situation. Everyone's a little bit different in that regard. Absolutely, I get that. When I, when I play, my hand gets really cold. Yeah, it depends, I guess, on the situation, right? Especially when you're not playing from your from your own home. Sometimes in these convention centers, it can get pretty cold, and sometimes it's incredibly hot with all of the computers running at the same time. So having a bit of variety available there can be very handy. We are going to go to another quick little break. We still have some tech issues here during this series, so we'll see you on the other side. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Showtime, this is Sarah, this is Raynor, and we will be reviewing our player cards. I go first? Sure. Yeah, the middle one. Oh, right. always see. first. Okay, not bad actually overall. What does it say? Okay, I have attack 79, defense 88, solid. Strategy 75, speed 81, macro 88, and micro 82. Overall 82. Actually, quite happy with that. I think it's better than last year. That's pretty solid. Yeah, so yeah it's all around solid. A bit low on the strategy, wise, strategy but department. I think it's fair. I'm quite predictable, so I don't uh, mind. I don't know. I don't know. I have seen some nasty things. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I, I remember the Proxy Twilight build. Oh, yeah, that was a good one. That oh, good. the light shade game? Yeah, I remember that as well. So I start, uh, yeah, the attack. Attack's a bit low, but. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it should be lower than the yeah, defense. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's fair. I think <laughs> Attack is 94. Defense, 99. Stretch is 94. Speed, 96. Macro, 99. And Micro, 98. <laughs> That's not bad. I feel like this card is for maybe on Mondays I'm here, but... You are a Zerg player, it should be below 90. No, we should. What? No, we should. It's no. one for micro, come on. What? You see, the link split is against the mines, though. No. Oh, come on, man. Okay, that's fair. Against mines, sure. Yeah. The link splits, the link bane in ZVZ. I'm not... Well, I'm not sad. sad. <laughs> <laughs> no shit, you're not sad. You're 97, dude. How, how you're the highest of all, right? I don't know. Probably. He has the, yes, he has the star, I think so. Yeah. Well, it means that there could be some authors with the same as well. Sure. Do I go? Go ahead. So, uh, 94. That's not bad, actually. I have uh, 95 attack, 93 defense, 89 strategy, 98 speed. I don't have the star on the speed. That means I'm How not much? the fastest anymore. How much? I think the yellow means it's uh, the highest probably. Isn't the star usually? No, I don't have any stars here, either. Oh. It's just the yellow. Okay, I guess I'm still the fastest. Macro 96, micro 93. 93, come on, man. My micro is insane. <laughs> micro. Good old micro. Yeah. Oh, on, I have seen the link by micro. It's, uh, it's pretty nice, though. It's nasty. <laughs> nasty, yeah. It's... I guess mine's as well. Come on. Are you pleased? Yeah, I'm not sad about it. 89 strategy, I think it's a little bit low. Yeah, considering <laughs> you are somewhat of a mastermind yourself, it is a bit low. They used to call me the build genius in uh, elementary school. Um, <laughs> I was just. Uh, the head behind all the builds. To be honest, let's be fair, I invented a lot of stuff in StarCraft. And there's countless stuff that I invented now, it doesn't even yeah. come to mind. But yeah, I'm uh, happy about it. I mean, it could be higher, but it's gonna get higher after I win. Yeah. <laughs> sure. You're not a believer in the ring, right? I'm not a believer. I'm a believer, but I'm just not sure when the second next card is gonna be, so. That's, that's a fair point. I could be washed between, I mean, that's kind of what happened with Gamers 8. No comment. I won, then I was watched, no and then... Yep. 
that's it thanks for watching let us know your opinions down in the comments thank you so much bye bye We are back with the round of 12 here at I Am Karavitsa 2024. We are in a series between Bjorn and Gumiho. It looked for a little bit like this was going to be a clean sweep for Bjorn, where he was going to be able to get a 3-0 win. But ultimately, Gumiho managed to get a point on the board as well. And, well, Bjorn really seemed to take it personally. Yeah, I think Bjorn just knew. He's like, hey. I'm known for my micro. I micro great all the time. Nine times out of ten, I win from that position because I got the first Reaper. You saw Gumiho's reaction, right? When the yeah, Reaper and Marine went he down, he was like, head. it's happened. I've lost it. He stayed in it. He made it work out. Uh, Bjorn made the mistakes. And that led us to this game number four. So we get to go for one more at the very least here in this TVT. Here in the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice 2024. Gumiho taking on Bjorn with Bjorn still on that 2-1 lead on match point. Once again, going to be starting though in the bottom right-hand corner with the Red Terran player from Cloud9, it's Gumiho. And his opponent in the top left, make some noise for Bjorn. Oh, really? We're going to go ahead and do it again, this time around very offensively. Double racks this time around, so he's going to go 2 rex straight away. Puts them down the ramp from the third base. This is not somewhere you would typically check with the SCV as Gumiho if you do go checking for proxy racks. Let's see if he gets gas number two on the way. It is time. And if he does not, that's already a little build order advantage here for Bjorn in the early stages. Absolutely. Getting those barracks up unscouted is absolutely massive. So far, Gumiho has not really been opening up with too much scouting information, right? In the previous game, he went for a single gas barracks factory with a marine and then into a reaper eventually and a command center on the low ground. It's not an opener where you can get a lot of vision. So if he once again is going to get completely unscouted, I think Bjorn is hoping he's playing against the same build once more. It's going to be very yep. tough for Gumi. This is, this is honestly, I mean, the fact that Bjorn's now proxy to Raxing means that the first Reaper shows up sooner as well, so the timing all together is quicker. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I love it for Bjorn. This does not feel like it gets much better for him. It's the same opener again right here. Yeah, for yeah it's exactly the same, right? It's the Marine into the Reaper, so the Reaper is on the way. The Marine goes down the low ground. He's going to check the natural, but there's no way this Marine goes far enough out to check the third or, or down the ramp from the third. There's just no way. Like, you can't risk it. So, yeah, you're blind to this. Now, Gumiho will be starting up a command center as well, and that is another really big target here for so Bjorn. There it is. This is a very greedy start indeed, especially when you're 2 to 1 behind against one of the world's greatest Terrans. Gumiho believes he can get away with it, but this is the moment where Bjorn reveals what he's up to. Yep, yeah, Gumiho not going to react just yet. He is going to have the Reaper here for a moment. Bjorn is going to lose a Reaper. He's going to get a Reaper in return, but one for one is good for Gumiho. Mm -hmm. That helps a lot. You want to lower the Reaper numbers to make it possible for your Hellion to come through and to not get killed off. So that's the big plan. We're even going to go second Hellion this time around from Gumiho. Absolutely, and with the double barracks over here on the other side of the map, Bjorn's follow-ups are going to be quite a bit weaker. Now, <laughs> we are here. The Hellion is already out. He's going to try and just line those units up as best he can. But I'm liking this a lot here for Gumi. Yeah, this was a good defense so far. Bjorn definitely did not find the damage he was looking for. The CC continues to build. Obviously, Bjorn's going to have a couple more Reapers in a moment. But as those couple of Reapers come out, like, it's getting dire, man. There's already two Hellions here. Now a Cyclone starts as well. These four Reapers have to put in some work. The Hellion, the damage taken there is going to be repaired just as the Reapers have healed up as well. It's important to not take splash damage off the Hellions, but he didn't get really damage done on the Hellions there either. So the major threat to these Reapers is not doing anything. And this attack from Bjorn is not succeeding at all. And just Bjorn losing one Reaper straight away, it just makes it then so much tougher to get the Hellion afterwards, right? And if he then can't get that Hellion, it just starts to snowball and Gumio holds on. And I wonder if, in, in a way, that faster factory does make this overall a bit better against the proxy 2 Rax Reaper, because then you yeah. have that Hellion a little bit sooner. The Reaper and the Marine were together this time around as well, which yep. makes it much, much easier for Gumi to hold on. The Reaper count is big, but honestly, with a Cyclone out and two Hellions, I don't know if you can really get much done. You can bruise that command center, sure, but the Orbital Command, and that's the most important part, is already building here, and you're certainly not going to get the full kill. So the longer that this goes on, the better it's going to be for 
Gumiho here defensively. Now, one barracks is going to be used for scouting. The other one will be flying all the way back home. But that does mean that Bjorn in the meantime is not really using any of those structures. Uh, for, uh, I was just smiling right there at the hyperflight rotors. He's not using any of the structures, of course, to build add-ons. That means any follow-up is much slower. Now, the green light is once more spotted. Reapers are gonna... Oh, whoa! Oh, and he gets one of the Cyclones! He's gonna get one, he's gonna find number two, maybe! He mistargeted for a second, couple grenades. Now the Hellions come back home, so they did not go across the map. I mean, you get the two Cyclones, it's something at least, but your army supply is already still in trouble, and Bjorn just not making it happen with these proxies. I mean, he scouted with the barracks as well. Again, his own Cyclone's coming up with the Raven. Bjorn basically needs to play very well from here and not take any damage from these harassing units because if he takes any damage at all, he's gonna end up in a pretty rough position. He's already a little bit behind. Any further damage is gonna cement that lead for Gumiho. Yep, Gumiho essentially playing an identical build here once again, but this time around his start is a lot nicer. Hyperfight Rotors, are we gonna go into any sort of... No, we're not gonna be going into the upgrade, it seems, for the Cyclones. He's not making quite as many of them, but Hyperfight Rotors still a very handy upgrade to get those Benchies across. Uh, yeah, now it's Bjorn who has to play a much more defensive strategy, right? Like, he's he's got a very mobile army, but can he, can he really just sit back with it? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I, I'm just so worried about Bjorn taking more damage, right? That's yeah. the problem. You see Gumiho is going to go into the extra factory. He is going to play into the mech this time around. And as Bjorn tries to find those Hellions, but they're pretty speedy as well, so Gumiho will just get chased off with those. Hyperfly Rose about to finish. We'll see if Banshees can find anything in the end. And as Bjorn just continues into Cyclones, the Ravens. This really was a very Cyclone-heavy series so far. I really wasn't expecting that between these two, but... Mm -hmm. And last here we are, turns out Cyclone's still pretty good. Gonna watch Bjorn's first person view as he works his way around here. I mean, the problem is you can see the lack of vision, so if there's a Banshee coming from any angle and it moves quickly, you have no idea about it. And now most of your anti is across the map. Uh, maybe I'm looking into his expression a little bit too much, but he does not really quite look as confident as he did earlier when we had his first person view and his camera as well. Right now he seems to be struggling a little bit, trying to make the best out of this very rough early game. Not that long ago, the man was leading 2-0. to zero. This is the moment, though, where he finds out about those Benchies. Sure, he's got a Raven, but the Hyperflight Rotors is done, and they're just going to fly away. Yeah, he's going to try and go for an attack into the natural. He knows he needs to deal damage, and he might have the Cyclone advantage right now, so he's going to try and make it happen. He's got all the turrets he can put down. That's something that Gumiho does not have in return. So you do see the instant pull on the SCVs. Bjorn will get a lot of SCVs. The Cyclones of Gumiho not fighting, so this is three SCVs right now, and Bjorn has some very good numbers here. Now he's taking a lot of damage as well. We can't see how much that is just yet, but that's definitely going to help Gumiho to stabilize from the damage he's taken. Bjorn sits at 51 supply. Gumiho sits at 48. Bjorn has eight more workers. An army supply deficit, though. He kind of just needs to get home and defend himself, and he's kept making Cyclones. That will help. We're using the line of sight blockers with the uh, scan, allowing him to get triple kill with the two wow. Cyclones. Bjorn shuts down the army lead, and he's going to be able to defend from here. Benchies also have gone down in favor of Bjorn right there. Well, the Benchies at least that Gumiho made. Now Gumi, by the way, goes for that threading upgrade. So he is going to be able to get the speed boost on those Cyclones. But this is a different approach than what he did in the first time around. We saw that strat. I think this was on Equilibrium earlier. Third Command Center is going to finish up here as well for Bjorn. He's got a nice advantage right now, but it's important he does not get too aggressive. Did all the Banshees die? Can we just get a, a yeah, yeah, they check? Died. So that everything is dead. All right, so it's one Raven, five Cyclones against eight Cyclones. I mean, a little defense advantage, I suppose, pre-split, kind of concave, for example, right? Gumiho is up 11 army supply. Can you translate that into something? Mm. Bjorn is still up a few SCVs, so he can pull some SCVs if he needs it for the defense. Cyclone versus Cyclone, mech versus mech. There is one Raven in the mix as well that can put in quite a bit of work. Nice concave right there for Bjorn. He pushes it back for now. Any time right now that he can buy is good. Yep, absolutely. Anything will help as you're going to see some SCPs. He's going to have to actually get in the front this time around. Bjorn is making a lot of Cyclones himself, also his own Liberators. As we do see Gumiho, I mean, this is the fact. He is just ahead in army supply. Has been for a while. Couple of Cyclones loaded into the Medivacs. He loses Bjorn. One more Cyclone there, though. And this is Gumiho, who's still just being able to get a little bit ahead on the production from the early game. Bjorn shaking his head. He's realizing that Gumiho has enough. SCVs are dropping for Bjorn more than he can afford, and he's not going to have enough Cyclones here. Gumiho across the map ties up the series. We're going to game five.
I love those meta effects in conjunction with those Cyclones, right? It's such a funny combination of units. For the longest time, we only ever saw them being used with biological units that they can heal up, but it turns out they're pretty fantastic as well against units that lock on to certain targets because she can obviously decline that lock on there. So what was previously a 2-0 lead for Bjorn is now turning into an even score. And this micro over here, this engagement over here, I'm not exactly sure how Bjorn took it. Yeah, well, he split the damage as well. He shot Reaper, then Marine, then you yep. know, went back to the Reaper. And you just got to be so decisive if you're going to go up the ramp and take the first shot. So this is obviously chaos. This is where we were kind of obviously in Fion's first person view as well. And we saw him trying to defend this. So this is what the Banshees were up to in this time. They got so many workers quickly, but then Bjorn was able to, with these order turrets, do so well. And yeah. these SCVs were then just kind of taking damage without dealing damage at the same time. Honestly, if Bjorn like walked away right then, maybe he's okay. But the problem is he stayed and fought. The next couple of trades weren't as good for him. And then Gumiho, just because the start was better, already had the factories in play to have more Cyclones producing, so his reinforcements across the map were way too good. Absolutely. Gumiho, looking confident right now. Not really too concerned anymore about how this particular series is going. And look at Bjorn, right? The body language here really is speaking volumes. He's checking, yo, is my mouse still okay? Should I be cleaning the mouse feet right now? Is everything all right? Those are the sorts of things that you don't worry about when you're feeling really good about the way that you've been playing. Gumiho looking stoic. Our final game here, it's going to take place on the map Solaris. Yes, it is as these two stare each other. Well, not really down, but in a way. <laughs> in the top right-hand corner, he's brought it all the way back from 0-2 to give us a full series. Katowice, let's make some noise for Gumiho! And down here in the bottom left-hand corner of this final map, he needs your energy. He is Bjorn. Big fan of not proxying after the last two games. Yes. You want to have an hour-long TBT, Wardy? Sure. Yeah, let's go. Why not? It's been a fun series. Um, lots of lots of action, lots of little micro fights. That game two on Equilibrium was really a little bit more drawn up and not the kind of stalemate TVT way you usually see. Solaris wouldn't, I don't think, allow Bjorn to play like that though, so no. if this does go longer, expect a bit more of a split map scenario. It can just as easily come down to those Cyclones early though. Absolutely. This series can be decided in the next couple of minutes because you need to do everything right for a macro game to happen. Gumio has been playing a similar strategy in every single game. Single gas into a barracks, into a factory, and then eventually a command center. Yeah, Marine into Reaper. It's an interesting combination, and I wasn't 100% sure about it, but the way he defended in the previous game was really stellar. Yeah. No, I mean, he... I, I, there's got to be something about it that you're playing so greedy, you don't do any scout, and usually at least with the uh, one gas expands, you would take some kind of like SCV across the map, because then at least you know before you put the CC down exactly. that there's a barracks missing, right? So there's got to be something about which Gumiho says, okay, actually, yeah, I'd be able to like defend this. So maybe with that factory coming in sooner, the you get the heli in a bit yeah. faster. Like you've got a moment of weakness, but if your opponent banks up two Reapers and doesn't go straight away, you've got a Marine and a Reaper and it's kind of okay on the high ground. I'm gonna have a little split screen here as these two <laughs> set up and it is different setups. Bjorn will be the faster expander this time around. He's had enough of that proxy in action, and Gumiho does go with that faster factory once again, just to get up defensively if needed. It's a modern art here, man. What a beautiful thing. You could print this screenshot, put it on the wall. And they say StarCraft couldn't be beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Gumi defending here, but yeah, you're absolutely right. He doesn't really know about what's going on in this game, right? Bjorn has decided, though, to also do a scoutless opener as he is going for that command center here. He hasn't seen where his opponent is at, but luckily for him, Solaris is a two-player map. <laughs> it, it does usually give it away, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, I know he's not in the bottom left, so... <laughs> he starts scouting the top left, we're like, no, <laughs> no not this time. <laughs> Hellion comes in, just gonna move into this natural. CC will finish in time, so the SCV can run away up the ramp if the Hellion chases too far. There's a Reaper and Hellion in the wings, waiting to jump on that. We are going to be already a difference here. Reactor on the way from Bjorn, while Gumiho is actually already got a reactor, just waiting to move the factory over to it. So, slight difference there. He's actually, well, I mean, I guess that makes sense. Bjorn expanded sooner, so he's on a bit of a later factory, so he's yep. got a slightly later cyclone. Absolutely. Gases are being taken right now as well on the low ground. 
Cyclones are real good, but Ravens are very powerful too, and they're an extremely expensive gas unit. Very popular, of course, in this matchup. We don't see them as much in the other matchups, although they've been making their way into the Terran versus Orcs as well. Yeah, every now and again they, they get some popularity. TVP, obviously, they're pretty popular unless they get shot down by Ra uh, Phoenix. So. Yep, absolutely. But TVT, the, the Ravens really are just an imperative thing, right? Like, the player who doesn't go Ravens is so often just, like, in a more difficult position from the very get-go. So anybody wants to get in, just wants to scout, draw some units over here. Uh, maybe just doesn't want these units coming across the map as quickly, just to kind of join the medevac or anything. So, yeah, this medevac is making the move, and I don't believe Gumiho is set out just yet. He does load up, though, so maybe not a lot of defense in the main base as we come across here. And Bjorn will at least be able to poke and prod for maybe an SCV or so. He's set up defensively, yeah. He's going to boost after this medevac right here from his opponent. Those Marines are not going to get the pickup, or at least one of them. Uh, managed to sit in the plane at red hit points right now. But indeed, those Ravens are coming up. They have that ability to temporarily shut down ooh, the opponent's units. We do get a bit of damage done once again. Just more than half HP done is not bad at all, because that means it's very difficult right now for Bjorn to escape. Yeah, and we've talked about just how important that damage is, right? A little bit out up, because now Bjorn can't realistically harass with this. So he's going to keep it up on that top side and may keep a couple units back from Gumiho, but nowhere near as threatening as it once was so Gumiho will move out with that medevac finally himself to look for some harass. Don actually is gonna find the exit down the left hand side, gonna go join up with everything else and together this little force. I wonder if he can find something here. The Hellion might get the spot on these units, and he does. So Gumiho now knows once again where Bjorn is at, and he has got that medevac moving down the left side dangerously. We'll see what Bjorn has at home to defend this. Yeah, Bjorn at this point must realize that that medevac went somewhere, and the odds of it going home, it's pretty low. So he decides to ride his units back as well. And Three SCVs, he's gonna have to pay that price, but that is relatively okay, right? If you don't have anything to defend against those Cyclones, they can kill a Mineral Line very rapidly. As Bjorn is making a transition towards that Bio Army, and we see the same thing as well happening on the other side of the map. A barracks coming up, we have Engineering Base as well. Stimpak being researched on both sides of the map. Yeah, they're both getting that Stimpak up. The Raven's coming through, so we're gonna see Marines on Marines this time around. Bjorn has moved away from the Cyclones a little sooner, so it's important he stays well defensively. And, you know, don't take too much damage or anything. And just make it as... Oh, good Matrix is going to guarantee you that you get rid of the Cyclones, but you do lose a Raven in the process. So a little bit of a shame there. At least Gumiho got something out of these losses. Absolutely. The Medevac is going to be able to go back home. There's the upgrade starting up, though, for Bjorn. Engineering base a little bit later here for Gumiho, playing it just a bit more defensively overall, right? Really the way that we expected this particular series to go. Bjorn has got that third command center already landed on the low ground. This does get scouted here as well by an empty medevac. Gumi, okay, we want to try and save that. Yeah, it would be nice to keep it alive as well. Oh, the boost, and that's a complete wow. shutdown as well. Man, Bjorn not having a good time trying to be aggressive this game. Gumiho's deep defense has been great, and Gumio says, you know what, I see you being a little bit faster to everything, so you've got to have missed something somewhere along the way. I've killed a bunch of units as well, mm -hmm. so he's going to try and go across the map, and I love this responsible decision from Bjorn. He says, you know what, I get it. This game hasn't been going great for me. Let's not go overboard. Let's not die trying to hold a third, or let's not lose, lose that third when I can't defend it. Mm -hmm. Just going to pull it back, and I think that, like I say, is a super responsible choice. Gumiho sees that right now. He decides to load up those units that he can inside of the medevac to put on me. Maybe a little bit of harassment here and distract the opponent. Stimpak is finishing up right now, though, here for Bjorn, and that's going to make those Marines, even though it's not that many, they're going to be significantly more powerful. Three Cyclones have been split up from the main pack to try and go after the ones inside of the main base, and they are going to fall. Medivacs, in the meantime, decide to load up over here. That is a little risky by Bjorn, but he slitters away. Risky, but if he gets across the map with Stim and everything done, a lot of potential, right? So mm -hmm. maybe an opportunity he can gain something he can get from all this. He scans into the main base and he sees the unit's position there. So we'll see if he commits or not. There's even missile turrets already in location. So Gumiho is being very cautious about potential drops like this. And now we're going to see the masses of Ravens coming through. They're going to go shooting down some add-ons. Combat shield will be denied. Not the worst thing to lose out on. We're going to drop another order turret because we just want to get rid of the reactor. Reactors are expensive. Bjorn says, okay, well, I'll get some SCVs. He has been behind an SCV, so it's good for him to catch up a little bit. Still has this drop aiming toward the main base. There's still units nearby from Gumiho, but he's going to be yeah. right in the back here, Bjorn, and he is going to be able to get a few SCVs here also. Yeah, Hellion also in the mix, by the way, which is kind of nice. The leftover Reaper from the early game apparently also got a trip in the plane. Sadly here for Bjorn, those upgrades have just finished up, so he's just a few seconds late. Gumiho will be very happy about that. And this is quite expensive here for Bjorn to lose. Gumiho is starting to grab that supply advantage. These auto turrets are not going to be able to achieve too much, but 
Well, yeah, they're going to do a SCVs. Yeah, I was going to say, he was on top of them at the very start of it, but ultimately a ton of SCVs in red do fall. Terrifying for Bjorn, though, because A, is without combat shields for a while, and B, he does not have as many Ravens. So any fight, Gumiho is going to have more Raven energy, and we praise the Raven in this matchup, you know? Mm -hmm. So to be without those Ravens really is, or with just less Ravens, is tough. Gonna go back in the main base here. There's a tank in range so that shouldn't go very far. You can't get on top of the tank because of the missile turret. Get a couple more SCVs, then we're gonna take our leave through the top side. Only a few Marines left there. Throughout all of this, Gumiho has been a little bit ahead in supply here. Bjorn gets some lock-ons, but he's got less numbers, so it's not really a fight he wants to take. And yeah, he somehow he trades fairly evenly on the Cyclone War there. Yeah, some, sometimes the Cyclone Wars do look a little funky like that. Medivac's dying on the top as well. Yep, and that is very expensive. Those were not empty. One other thing here as well, by the way, is that Bjorn has decided to go for double upgrades. They're just about to finish up here, maybe a half minute or so away from finishing. Whereas Gumiho has only just now started the plus one and there, or sorry, the plus two for the infantry weapons. And now he just started up the armor upgrade too. Bjorn is forced to remake that combat shield. Very easy upgrade to forget. We saw that earlier today as well from Bunny in that series against Clem, which is uh, certainly not what you're looking for, but especially when you lose it, right, and you have to remake it, it's easy to forget, but Bjorn, he is on point here. No, doing the right thing as these medivacs will find the entry point through the bombs. I believe that's a missile turret in the main base of Bjorn, so a little bit of damage on the way. In fact, double turret. So the medivacs will not have a free entry into that base. And as the sensor tower will finish up in a moment from Gumiho, just as Bjorn opens up these rocks, and Bjorn's army will be in range of that sensor tower. Only one missile turret fires, the drop will get all the way in. And at the same time, Gumiho is obviously looking to take position around the left-hand side, so a lot for Bjorn to react to and defend. And obviously, Bjorn, uh, Gumiho being the aggressor is going to give him a lot of opportunities now. Yeah, Bjorn is moving on the right side of his bases. He is not quite prepared for this move into the natural expansion. And here we go. Siege Tanks trying to get up onto the high ground. Bjorn's, well, Siege Tanks here are interference matrix. Massive anti-armor missile too. Bjorn cannot go up on this high ground. Those Siege Tanks, I mean, uh, I guess they can get matrix here, but this is dangerous. I mean, this is horrible, really. He was just super out of position. He had no idea where Gumi Hozami was. The lack of map control really biting him in the end. He has a concave and he has 2 2 to help him out. Yeah. And that is going to help him out. As Bjorn pushes through, he will get a cleanup. He lost a lot of SCVs, and he's still down, but at least he ain't out. He's lost more. Does he have any tanks? He really needs something to hold position and just to stabilize. But even if he does, there's four Ravens still of Gumiho. They've gone unhindered throughout this game. Bjorn indeed not losing, or sorry, not having any... Oh, 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 oh Ravens! Here made those Ravens sleeping on the job for just a moment. Gumiho loses a huge chunk of his army. Siege Tank there unseached as well. It does get saved just barely, but that green zone allows Bjorn to cross the distance to that army. He's going to get the Siege Tank as well, and Bjorn with the armor upgrade helping him win the Marine versus Marine battles. He is going to be able to come through here and somehow keep this game within reach. He's sieging tanks. He's taking position without Ravens. It's so difficult for Gumiho to break tank positions now. And so Bjorn is working on something beautiful suddenly. Okay, Bjorn, can he keep his head cool here? Gumiho just lost all the Ravens that he had. He's not in a position to really rebuild them either. So both players have been reduced to just siege tanks, Metavex, and Marines. Plus three was started up, by the way, here. Bjorn going for his signature armor upgrade first. Always an interesting one. Yeah, don't don't love that. And obviously, in this situation, you're the one with double engineering bay. Go get that plus three attack as well. It is going to be Gumiho taking the better and faster upgrades overall than as Bjorn has to build his fourth base up on location. So that's still setting up here. As we try and take position around the left side, we're going to load up and go towards the main base. A little bit crazy. He's got a step ahead of the units of his opponent. He's just going to decide not to go for it. I mean, I guess that's fine. Your opponent had to respond with the lift up as well. Your tank still holds a position here. And then Bjorn will just drop back down. More on reinforcements joining. He's got a slight army supply lead, but attacking in is much harder. Absolutely. Bjorn, he's got to be careful here. It's easy to get over eager. He's still pushing into somebody who has tanks. That green zone is nice. Your units are faster, but you have to be cautious. Gumiho's units, of course, also are spawning closer to the battle. Defender's advantage is nice, but these siege tanks in blue, they're putting a ton of pressure here on the left side of this third base. 
You know, it's funny because defender's advantage is a very real thing, but so is the positional value of an army in TVT. So sometimes being the attacker can feel so good because moments like that, positions like that are so valuable. Unprotected base here, double lib on that, could get rid of a bunch of SCVs and just knock down a little bit of a supply oh. lead in terms of workers that we've got. Bjorn pushes forward once these siege tanks right now gets one of them. The base lifts off and the liberators are chunking through SCVs. Ten workers will go down here and Bjorn has equalized the worker count. One lib in the natural as well to add to all of this. Yeah, nicely done. The Vikings will come clean it up, but well, he has Gumiho. He's making that big move through the middle of the map, and I think Yun's realizing it. He's realizing, hey, you're not fighting me anymore. Let's go back home and defense. He will have some reinforcements back on the other side. There we not go. soon enough, perhaps. Oh, just saves the tank. Yeah, Bjorn does have a couple tanks at home ready to defend. That is incredibly handy because he was just about to meet a massive army from Gumiho up on the high ground. This game was flipped upside down when both players ended up losing their Ravens. Initially it was Bjorn, then Gumiho lost all of them as well, and that has made this game incredibly scary. It's super close, man. We are talking about three bases of Gumiho against four of Bjorn right now, because Bjorn has denied that triangular base, right? So that's a pretty big deal. Upgrades are going to be slightly different times here as well. Gumiho will have the 3-3 fully in play. Bjorn missing that attack upgrade for a few moments, so a small factor to consider there that maybe the next couple moments of marine fights will be slightly better for Gumiho. But it's so hard to notice that in the chaos that is ensuring right now, as we just have tanks trying to clip edges of marines' armies. Those Liberators are lovely though, because they can of course be used to force the opponent's siege tanks to either commit or to un-siege. So Gumiho, at least, uh, at least he will be able to re-secure that base. Bjorn is not going to be able to resist and load up those units into Medivex. This is what he loves to do, this is what he's very good at, but it's also incredibly dangerous, because he doesn't know where those Vikings in red are. They are moving further up north, but not quite far enough. No, they've stopped just shy, as we are going to see Bjorn boosted in. He will get a tank to siege up here as well, and the Marines just unloading in the back of the mineral line. It's it's just a distraction as well. It takes so much effort to clean this up versus Three. doing it. And now we can go on the other side at the same time. Gumiho dives in the main base of Bjorn. So we've got chaos all over the map. Gumiho is the first to take damage. Bjorn is pulling home to deal with this. Nothing here from Gumiho at all. What is happening? Well, Bjorn has the supply lead. That's the most important thing to note right now, but he will still lose a bit of production before this is all said and done. He's dropping the third loco. Yeah. He's loaded up all of his units and he's gonna hit the third hard. Bjorn loves these chaotic situations and you can see it reflected right now in the supply count. Damage all over the map though. Third base gets evacuated here from Gumi. Main base, okay, is safe. Bjorn is gonna be able to continue producing over there and he is still harassing his opponent's side of the map. Bjorn is just so good in these scenarios when you're both making the same unit and it's all about the aggression. That is where Bjorn shines. And Bjorn still has a fifth base, just taking position as well. Yeah, yeah. He's got an extra base up. It's still easy to lose oh. fight, but he's going to get a siege on some of the production. Couple tanks Three unprotected tanks. as Bjorn dives the main base once again. The Medivac cannot save the tanks. We're going to try and siege. It's messy. It's chaotic. Bjorn fighting here in the main. He's got the tanks in the low ground. Oh. Going to get sieged by a Liberator. The Marines come to save the day in that regard and he's pushing the bottom side we try and fly in with the meta fact but gumiho keeps on losing and Bjorn has so much more army in the middle of the map gumiho is recognizing that this game is slipping away from him he does drop these siege tanks though he's going to be able to clean up all three of them it seems maybe even get the fourth one as well in just a moment here's a reinforcement showing up right now from Bjorn. No, he is decided to step forward and he takes down the army and with that he is moving on to the